Hello, Blogging Heads viewers. I am uh, Jamie Kerchick from the New Republic, here with Matthew Iglesias. Oh. I'm Matt Iglesias from the Atlantic. Now, Matt, I understand you um, visited Brian uh, Butler in the... Butler, bu- bu- how, how is it pronounced? Boiler. Boiler, who um, was tragically shot last week, but apparently he's doing well. Yeah, he is. I mean, you know, as well as uh, one could right. in circumstances. Right. Expected to make a full recovery. Okay, good. Well, we obviously give him our uh, best wishes. Thank you, I think. And um, we are here to talk about some uh, important issues today. Indeed. Uh, first, I want to... You, you, you had some interesting posts on July 4th. Yes. Um, about patriotism. It's so, my annual, my annual um, skepticism about the American Revolution. Yes, well, I want to question your patriotism. I want to start off right. this blogging has by questioning your patriotism. Because you said, and tell me if I'm characterizing this sure. appropriately, that looking back retrospectively, it would have been better had the American colonists decided to find some sort of rapprochement, if you will, with the British Empire and not well, I mean, the revolution. I think it's really more that it would have been better if the British government had been more creative in, in trying to find it. I mean, my understanding of the, the history is that the Americans, you know, really did try quite hard to find a compromise. It wasn't like there were hardcore American nationalists who really, really wanted an independent country and were just sort of hell-bent on it. There were a bunch of concrete, you know, grievances that they were trying to get addressed, um, and the British government, you know, was ultimately not that accommodating of them, and so war broke out. But, you know, I think people on both sides of the Atlantic would have been better off if, if the empire had been able to stay together. Why? I mean, Why? Isn't, it, isn't, well, isn't America exceptional? Isn't it, isn't it wonderful that America is what it is, or, or that, that we have an America, as opposed to America being part of the British Empire? I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, I never took you for someone who was an enthusiast for empire, so I'm... I'm well, no, but I... Defending. <laughs> Well, you know, I mean, there's 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 one thing is the question of the, those sort of um, you know imperialist adventures. But I mean, you know, the United States and the United Kingdom are very close partners um, in geopolitical terms, right? Today, now. sure. Uh, today, right, as are Canada and Australia, the other sort of main British. The Anglosphere. Uh, Right, exactly. The, the, the Anglosphere. And and that closeness came about for a reason. I mean, there are shared values. And also, you know, there was a time, particularly between World War One and World War Two, when you didn't have that kind of close collaboration between the United States and Britain. And, you know, I think most people agree that that had quite destructive effects for the world. Um, sure, but isn't there something special about America, the way it was created? It was one of, you know, they say Israel and America are the only two countries created upon an idea. And weren't the ideas that animated the American Revolution laudable, and didn't they um, provide for great things in the future? I mean, they, would, do, I mean do you they, think we would have? Do you, do, you, do you think there would have been parliamentary democracy in Britain if if our f- own form of democracy hadn't taken shape the way it had in the United States? Well, obviously, you know, I, I'm not a historian of 19th century Britain, um, and you know, if it's the case that without the revolution you wouldn't have democracy. You know, I, I'll take democracy over the revolution. But, you know, it seems to me that right now the United States and England are, are both democratic countries. And, you know, at the time of the revolution, the United States was not particularly democratic. Um, so I'm just not sure that, that the question... It was democratic of, given what else there was in the world. I, I mean, it was. I mean, it was It was really no more... It was, you know, not less democratic than England, but, but not substantially more. And I think that if you look at it, that over the course of the 19th century, democracy sort of co-evolved in the United States and in England. And, uh, you know, I'm not sure that couldn't have happened. But, but to be clear, I mean, I... I would take democracy over over union, uh, you know, if that's really the choice. You also said that you found American patriotism and all all forms of patriotism to be arbitrary, and you sort of compared it to like sports fandom, and that mm-hmm. if you're from Boston, you support the Celtics, and if you're from America, you're obviously patriotic about America. But well, and I, I, still- I think. To, to be clear, I mean, you know, I think that's because you know, if you support Boston, you, you'll be a Celtics fan, not just. You know, because Celtics, but because you have certain ties to your your native region, and you know, part of being a Bostonian, a New Englander, is also being an American. Just but don't you think being an American, American patriotism is unique in that people from all over the world come here, and you have first generation immigrants who are oftentimes much more patriotic than than Americans who've you know who can trace their lineage back to the Mayflower. Are there any other countries that are like that? I I can't really think of any. Well, you know, uh, there's almost a patriot- universal patriotism about America that people, even people, even people who don't even live here, 
are patriotic about America, and they want to come this, here. I mean, th- this is what I was saying, that this is where, you know, it's true, obviously, the United States has some unique virtues, as do some other countries, but that, you know, precisely where conservatives go wrong with this is in, I think, overstating the universality of the affection that we Americans feel for our own country. I mean, mean, it's true that the United States attracts immigrants from from all around the world, but other countries do that too, and, you know, there's a lot of economic motivations behind migration. And and the point is, is that, you know, I like this country a lot, you know, it's, it's something you really appreciate if you ever go abroad for any extended period of time, is that, you know, all kinds of things about your native country strike you as, as you know, just incredible, and, and you regret it, and you miss them. But that, you know, we shouldn't, when we talk about international politics, overstate the extent to which, you know, there's, overstate the extent to which there's really a sort of universal sentiment around the world about America that's the that's same true. as our own sentiment about it. Well, do you believe do you believe America is, is exceptional? America is clearly exceptional. In a good way or a bad way? I think in good and bad ways. I mean, I, I think, um, you know, it's certainly better that we're the dominant power than that China is. For well, sure. Example. Sure. Um, but, you I know. Mean, that, that, that's an important point of agreement, I think. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, don't you I think mean, are there, are there really, you know, uh, huge advocates of Chinese hegemony? Well, I, the way I look at it is, mm-hmm. and you you attack American hegemony a lot in your writing, if I'm not incorrect, or well, a, certain, a certain a certain brand of. But it, the right. way I see it, I see this whole global power stuff is mm-hmm. really being a zero sum game, and right. wherever America retreats, it's not like some nice you know liberal internationalist um, notion of of power is going to play out. It's like the Chinese are going to come in, or the Russians are going to come in. Right, I mean, some I'm other glad, power is going to come in. I'm, I'm glad you said that, because I, I think often it's, it's hard to get clarity on that point, which is that what conservatives do is they see international relations as zero-sum. And, and it's true, you know, if you see it as zero-sum, then a lot of things, for example, the Bush administration has been doing, you know, make sense within that frame. But mm-hmm. I think it's just wrong. I mean, you know, it's well known that international trade is a positive-sum kind of endeavor. <laughs> Trade so is certain, short. yeah. Right, right, right. But I mean, but but I mean, trade is positive sum because it's part of a, a larger set of, of human reactions. That when countries cooperate, as you know, the United States and Canada, or the United States and England do, that's good for both sides. It's not a zero sum relationship. One thing that's problematic about certain major countries being auto- authoritarian, like China, is that it's much more difficult to cooperate with China in a sort of productive way, or, or Iran, than it is with a Canada or, you know, an Italy. But it's still possible, and it's important to remember that. Yes, that's true. Um, I guess I'm just a little less sanguine about the um, potential of liberal internationalist institutions, primarily the UN, um, to kind of make up the balance. Sure, but look, I, I just don't think I just don't believe in the whole notion of an international community. Because if right. an international community um, is predicated upon everyone following the same rules, having the same understanding of how the world works. And I just don't see that. I see um, I really kind of buy into the you know the Robert Kagan thesis here that you have the West, Western liberal democracies play by their own set of rules and far better faith and you have these, you know, autocracies. You have Russia, China. I mean, it's it's unquestionable that if you look within the democratic community, you have a much higher degree of trust, a much higher degree of cooperation than you can have with autocracies. But I think the problem with the with the Kagan view and 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 what what you're outlining here is that you act as if it's a completely binary situation where you know you have either the the sort of the you know the house of cooperation or you have the house of war. You know, in fact, there are some countries whose leadership becomes so irrational and so despotic that that there's nothing nothing you can do about it. But that, you know, with most countries, most autocracies, I mean, I think China's a great example of this. It's a, it's a middle range. We can't have the kind of intimate relationship we have with Japan or with South Korea. But at the same time, you know, the U.S. and China have a lot of interests in common. We have collaborated on things. And simply, you know, the ha- fact of having peaceful commerce with them is very beneficial to both oh, sure. countries. I'm not a China hawk. I'm not, I'm not advocating for right. land war, land right. war in Asia. No. All right, no land um, war in Asia. But just, just of, naval sea battles, right? Speaking, well, yeah, speaking of China hawks, let's talk about the late Jesse Helms. Yes. And I know this has been a, uh, a 
problem for you over the past couple of days is the way the conservatives have been responding to the death. Yeah, I, I, I was interested, maybe, maybe naive. My, my initial intention had been to just kind of um, dance a little jig on his grave, um, you know, in, in somewhat poor taste. Um, but, but I was actually surprised to see the extent to which conservatives were so willing to embrace Jesse Helms mm. and not kind of say, you know, we agreed with him about some stuff, but meh. But, but instead, bad on you know, race. yeah, I mean, you had national- race question. Bad on the race question. Uh, you know, maybe the whole thing where he spent years saying that, you know, it would like be good if um, gay people all died of AIDS right. was like a little, a, a little over the top. Yeah. But instead, Heritage Foundation and National Review, at least, were just like, well, plant our flag here. Sure. This is conservatism. Sure, I agree with you. I have been um, somewhat appalled by the reaction of some conservatives. But I want to ask you. I mean, do you really think that this is a a partisan question, for example, like when when Jimmy Carter dies, do you think mm-hmm. liberals and Democrats are going to talk about, oh, well, he bequeathed to us, you know, the Iranian Revolution, Robert Mugabe in Zimbabwe, stagflation, on and on and on. I mean, I just think, you know, when someone well, but dies... This is, but, 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 right, but, but, but this is what I think, right? When Jimmy Carter dies, you know, conservatives are going to give, like, that kind of spiel. Right, like what liberals, what, I, are doing, what liberals are doing now. Right, yeah. right, right. No, no, exactly. But the question is, is you know, what are liberals going to do? Are, are liberals going to denounce Jimmy Carter in the terms that conservatives would? You know, no. I mean, I, I would say, and I will say right now, I, I don't think Carter, you know, was nearly as bad as he was made up to be. Uh, made out to be. But I'll also happily say that J- Jimmy Carter is not, like, the greatest American president. Y- you know, his his presidency became very unpopular. He, um, you know, he, he did a lot of things wrong. He made a lot of mistakes. Uh, that's the difference, is that, you know, conservatives aren't saying, look, you know, liberals overstated the case against Helms. They're saying Helms, Helms is our icon. Helmsism is is the standard to which we should all aspire. Well, here's what I'll and say. I don't think you'll see anyone saying that about Jimmy Carter. Well, I will say that both. Well, okay, well, um, I'm not sure about that. Depends on what liberals you're talking about. I mean, I'll just come all out right. and say I think both men, uh, in the case of Helms, was in the case of Carter, still is malevolent forces in our in our politics and in different ways, um, maybe of equal amount. Um, what, you know. what 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 is it that that Carter's doing that's malevolent? Well, I would, I mean, going abroad and denouncing his country and every, you know, tin, bo- tin pot dictatorship he can find. There was a, he, I mean, didn't he, didn't he uh, release the Israeli, he talks about the Israeli nuclear program at the Hay on Y festival. You know, those little things. Um, his writings on Israel I find to be pretty abhorrent. Um, what, what's abhorrent about his writing on Israel? I think it's it traffics. I'm always, you know, because I mean, I mean, I, I remember what, when it came out. You know, and he 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 titles the book what it was, it was peace, not apartheid. Peace, right? not apartheid. Yeah, right. And you know, pe- people freaked out, and and uh, you know, I mean, that's 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 not the kind of rhetoric I use because it it, it closes people's minds. But you know, it's it's is it accurate? Do do you think it's accurate? I think that it's accurate to it's an accurate description of the situation. Don't be afraid. I'm not going to call territory. you. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to call you. Any of this no, 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 right, right, right. I, I mean, I, I think it's important to be careful about this because obviously Israel within Israel proper, you know, is a is a real democracy where the Arab Israelis have rights, and that's completely in contrast to South Africa. Sure. In the occupied territories, I think there's a real analogy, but at the same time, I mean, it is true, obviously, that Israel's. Um, I don't think that the security rationale for maintaining control over the West Bank in that way is as compelling as the government of Israel thinks it is, but it's a bona fide difference between that situation and South Africa. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I mean, I don't think it's beyond the pale to raise that issue. I mean, I think you had my my colleague, uh, Jeff Goldberg, who is, uh, I think, much closer to to you on these questions than to me, Mm -hmm. was essentially raising this piece. uh, No, that's true. Times op-ed recently... um, you know, I mean, I, I, there's a lot of hostility to Carter from the, the sort of quote-unquote pro-Israel community. Um, you know, it's built up. He's not considered a, a credible messenger. But well, it's meeting, it's, and that, it's going, it's meeting with the leader of Hamas and mm-hmm. shaking hands with him. Mm-hmm. It's going to lay flowers at Arafat's grave. I mean, it's some, it's some pretty mm-hmm. awful things. And frankly, you know, he's, I actually think he was worse as president than he is, than he has been in his post-presidency, to be honest. Okay. Um, but again, when he's when he kicks the bucket, I think okay. liberals I think liberals are going to react in the same way that conservatives are about Helms. And you're going to see I, mean, I, I think 
A lot of the rules are going to be praising him for his post-presidential work and eradicating guinea worm and all these wonderful things he's done. And they're going to ignore some of the... Right, right, but Jamie, that, 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 that's completely different from what's happening. What you are not going to see is liberals saying that Jimmy Carter is the great liberal icon of our time. Have there been that many conservatives saying that about Helms? I think you saw it from National Review and you saw it from the Heritage Foundation. Mm -hmm. And that those are the sort of the marquee, you know, institutions of the conservative movement. Sure. You know, obviously, if Jimmy Carter dies and there's an incumbent Democratic president, he's going to come up with something polite to say about Jimmy Carter. As he should. As he should. But it, right. But, but I mean, it's also no secret, I think, that, you know, Democratic Party leaders, um, you know, think of Jimmy Carter as having had a failed presidency that, you know, they want to uh, avoid emulating. Well, here's a question about Carter. Do you think he's going to speak at the convention? Uh, I'm not sure. What, whatever they did last time, I think, will probably happen again. I, will I, that I be a problem for the... Which it was. With, what's, with what he's been doing over the past couple of years? I and mean, I think it's going to be a huge problem if... I if think... You, I think a... If you look state. at Jewish voters in Florida, uh -huh. okay, which is going to be a, a very a, a crucial state for either McCain or Obama... I think and that you know, you know I, I mean I, I think that the um, there have been predictions of sort of Jewish Jewish vote problems for Democrats for a while it hasn't materialized um, also I don't think Florida is really going to be as pivotal this year as it's been in the past because of um, Virginia and Colorado and so on and so forth but you know I mean I think it's definitely true that that, that Obama I think for reasons that have nothing to do with Jimmy Carter um, may have a somewhat tougher time with, with Jewish voters because of, you know, things um, he said uh, about his own views on Iran and, and so on and so forth. I mean, mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, in the case of John Kerry, you know, dragging Jimmy Carter into the argument had a certain utility. But, um, you know, with Obama, I mean, I think it's fair to try to attack his Iran policy. Um, I think those attacks are wrongheaded. But, I mean, you know, you'll have the argument about the policy rather than the argument about Jimmy Carter. Well, now that we're on Iran and Iraq, let's talk All about right. Barack Obama in Iraq. Ah, yes. Because I've been gloating over the past couple of days about you, what you, I... You were. And, uh, can I ask you about that? Uh, you, you wrote, you quoted a Wall Street Journal... Uh, I did. ...editorial, which said that... Um, it said that Obama, just as much as John McCain, is, is running for Bush's third term. I think that was the journal being a little... Uh, you know, the journal likes to... Uh, be humorous okay, so that was that page. was that was so that's like you and them trying to trying to kind of tweak my nose. A little well, bit. I I look if you want to vote for the anti-war candidate, Matt. I don't think it's Barack Obama anymore. I think you got to vote for Ralph Nader or Bob Barr. And you know, I uh, back in my well, high school well, why days. Is that? Back in my I mean, high, back in my high school uh -huh. days, I was a a Nader Raider. So I can give you some phone numbers if you. Yeah, if you want no, to I, I I I I don't. I, I mean, I I think we still have a we we've, we've always had a pretty serious contrast between McCain and Obama. We have, but if you look at the net roots and what they've been demanding of the candidate, what their singular most important issue is, it's been if not immediate withdrawal from Iraq, then certainly a hasty withdrawal from Iraq. And well, no, you know, it's, months it's, was too long for them, and now you have. I mean. We would at least admit that he has certainly changed his position. He's saying he's going to go to Iraq and he's going to refine mm -hmm. his position on Iraq withdrawal. No, and I mean, I, I think that's that's absurd. I mean, what, what he said, I think very clearly, has always been that he has a plan to withdraw troops within on a 16-month time frame, one to two brigades a month, and that's a strategic decision he's made, right. the allocation of resources, and that then he needs to refine the plan in terms of exactly how do you do that in consultation with military officials. Well, by refine that's the plan, always been his position. Refine the, what is refine the plan a euphemism for? What do you mean? It's not a euphemism for anything. It's a question of, it's difficult to do, right? I mean, if you said to me, Matt, draw up a scheme to withdraw one to two brigades a month over a 16-month time period, I couldn't do that. I would need to, you know, speak to military officers in Iraq about the logistics, about which places it's smart to go from sooner and later, about who should come, who should go. That's always been his position. As you said, it's never been one that the Netroots were really happy with. It was a, a movement that Chris Bowers led to... That's true. Try to pressure people. And Obama, you know, he always tried to maintain some flexibility about this. Because, you know, and I think I wasn't totally happy with that. But at the same time, it would be suicide to go into a campaign with a completely inflexible position. But still, you have McCain who wants to go for a, a totally undefined sense of victory, which involves a, a very permanent uh, American military presence there. And you have Obama who wants to reposition us out of Iraq and on to doing other things. And you also have completely different attitudes toward the regional context. Well, I don't think it's an undefined victory. I think you saw last week the 15 of the 18 benchmarks have been completed. Um, 
clearly violence is down, the surge is working, even Obama is now admitting it. Um, well, violence but, is down. There's, there's no question about that. But, I mean, what what is the philosophy that, you know, I mean, for McCain, he's one of these guys where, you know, when violence was up, that showed we needed more troops. When violence is down, we need more troops. He he likes to start wars with countries. Um, and what, do you mean, what do you mean to say he likes to start wars with countries? Can you get, what, what, is, what do you mean by that? I, I mean that, you know. Which, kind, so which specific in, countries does John McCain want to start a war with? Back in 1999, he expressed regret that we hadn't implemented a more hardline policy on North Korea that he admitted could have led to a destructive war, but that he favored. He said that we should be going for a ground invasion of Serbia and that we should accept only unconditional surrender. He spent a long time... Well, we did go to war with Serbia. I mean, there wasn't a ground... Wait, wait, no, no, no. This was during the war, though. He criticized the Clinton administration for not sending land troops into Serbia, and he also criticized them for not going for an unconditional surrender. He then spent a long time advocating for the invasion of Iraq. And on top of that, you know, he, he's... As, ar- did, as did a whole host of Democrats a, as well. A whole host, yes, indeed. And um, and then McCain has, has articulated consistently a, a policy of rogue state rollback. Which, as he says, you know, the first choice for this is not to go to war. He prefers to do it by trying to arm and, and supply um, opposition groups or something What's like that. What's wrong with but, that? Do you, are you no, 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 listen, that? listen, 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 listen to me. And he said, though, in his original Rogue State rollback speech, back when he was a much more honest candidate, you know, he said, we have to be clear with ourselves that this could lead to escalating commitments, and we need to take that commitment seriously. You know, which is... He is very willing to let these things escalate uh, into military conflict and very unwilling to take any kind of actions that might avoid it. That's a fundamental difference between John McCain and Barack Obama. I don't, what, I mean, I, by my count now, there have been six entreaties to the Iranians to get them to stop enriching uranium. There's one a couple weeks ago made by. Sure, there's, the there's, all, kinds, there's all kinds so, of entreaties. So, what, I just don't understand what, you know, what is it that Barack Obama is going to do? that's going to be new from the Bush administration. Um, the, the, the difference is obvious. I mean, you know, I, I don't know why people w- want to play dumb about this, but it's a question of are you going to have a good faith negotiation? where You don't think that the Bush administration is, is in good no, faith with the Bush, wants with to the Bush, disarm with, 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 the Iranian... You, you think that, that their prime motivation here is just going to war? No, 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 no. What the Bush administration is doing is saying, hey, Iranians, we'd like you to give up your nuclear program. And then the Iranians, you know, they 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 sort of shut down the weaponization, it seems, but keep keep working on the enrichment. And then right. Bush says, well, stop it, stop enriching. And, and they say no, which is different from being genuinely interested in finding a, a bargain and exploring things like when the Bush administration rejected, you know, previous Iranian overtures. Well, that, those are those are questionable. Those are not, I, I don't, I'm not sure I fully agree that those were, I'm talking about good faith efforts, if you want to say No, I mean, I, mean I, 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 I understand your, your, your pal, Eli Lake, you know, says that didn't happen, <laughs> but like respectable people, you know. Oh, so Eli's not respectable now, okay. Right, they, right. I mean, no, I, well, I mean, he's not. And, and, and I mean, look, it, well, well, I don't understand. Right. Why, I do not see that there is a difference between... Um, I mean, you, you talk about Iran as if they're like any normal state with interests and... It's a, it's a fairly normal state. Right? I don't think... You don't think that this is a state motivated by other things than just, say, Luxembourg? I think, I think uh, you know, all you know, states have some other interests, but this is exactly what I'm talking about, right? I mean, this is the sort of, you know, this hawkish dodge. When I say that, you know, you guys, you, you, you're, you're gearing up for a war with Iran, you get, oh, no, who's doing that? We've made all this peace. But then as soon as we start talking, right, you don't believe that Iran is a normal country that has interests that can be bargained with. Hey, Matt, right? right? I mean, my, my video, okay, hold on, my video stopped recording. Okay, now we're, now we're back. Keep on going, sorry. Okay, I, as I was saying, you know... I don't agree with you about that. No, I don't agree with you about that. I think Iran is not like any, like most other states. I think no, it's no, a revolutionary I, I state. Uh, right, I right, think right, it's right, a revolutionary right. state founded upon an ideology of exporting terrorism, exporting a certain type of militant radicalism right, that's, across that's, the that's world. Right, that's fine, but can, can, can we bracket this for a minute and, and just roll back, right, to the part where I was accusing you and John McCain of, of being warmongers, right? And, and this is what I'm talking about. To label right? I happily and, accept. And, and, sure, and, and, and good faith, right? I mean, you, if you go into a negotiating session with a country where you already believe 
that the country is not a normal country and can't be bargained with. You're not bargaining in good faith. Why? No, why? No, excuse me. It's, it's called realism, being realistic. It's understanding, no, 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 it's understanding no, 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 no. what the Iranians are about and what their record I, is and wait, what they plan to do. I don't see fine, why... That's fine. Look, look, look. If you want to hold to your wrong ideas about the Iranian state, that's fine. But you're not bargaining with them in good faith. So wait, so wait. You don't we think, dis- you don't no, think we, dis- it's- we disagree, it seems, on... We, we, we do disagree about that, but I, I want understanding of what I, Iran is and what it's no, about. No, no, no. Listen, I, I want to have that disagreement second, right? Okay. First, we were disagreeing about whether or not there have been good faith negotiations. Right. If you hold the views about Iran that you hold, you're not negotiating with them in good faith. So it's not just the so it's not just the Americans that you say aren't negotiating good faith. It's the entire EU, right? Because they're the ones no. who are leading. So it's the yeah, EU. Yeah. Been, the EU has been has been negotiating good faith, but the Americans haven't. I think saying? to some extent the EU has been. The EU is not in the kind of position that the United States is to really, um, you know, make deals with them, though. I mean, it's the United States has leverage on Iran. We well, have the um, EU doesn't they, have leverage over Iran in terms of in terms of sanctions and and you know in terms of um, this whole gasoline sanction the, the, that, that's been bad. I mean, the, they have that stuff, but the United States is obviously a more important country. I mean, sure it, is. it matters more to the Iranians what's their relationship with the United States okay, so than the specific paint me a picture then. You. Paint me a picture of what a good faith negotiation under Barack Obama looks like and how it's distinguished from what the warmongers in the White House have been doing for the past eight years. Look, it's perfectly clear, right? A bad faith negotiation, like a, a Jamie Kerchick negotiation, <laughs> starts with it starts with the assumption that you can't reach a deal with them. If you assume no, it doesn't. That no, it if doesn't. you assume if you assume that these guys are radical ideologues, hell bent on world domination, then there's not going to be any deal you'll ever agree to with them, right? And and all you're doing is kind of having a pissing match. Back no, there forth, are ways of which containing. unfortunately, I mean, we right containment, right? But I mean that a strategy of containment is not a strategy of good faith bargaining. But so tell me, I want to know what it is that you would do oh, that sorry. Barack Obama would do that would end the Iranian nuclear program. That hasn't been done by the Bush administration over the past eight years. You you try to reach an agreement that involves verifiable disarmament with inspections and, you know, whatever that whole suite of uh, sort of technical safeguards is. You try to do it? How do you... I'm I'm asking... No, 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 I'm saying... What do you do that hasn't been tried? Right. I'm saying this is the goal, right? The primary goal is to achieve verifiable disarmament. Sure. In exchange for that you have a willingness to make some kind of security guarantees and a process by which America's sanctions on Iran get ratcheted back over time. And, and this hasn't been offered before? This hasn't been offered in the past six no. offers? No? No. I don't think that that's the case. I mean, there is... Well, you're, you're dead wrong. I mean, this is the crux of the issue. You know, is the Bush administration has preconditions for their talks. They have, um, you know, and, and it's just, it hasn't been working and it hasn't been productive. And it's because, you know, as you were saying, I, I mean, a lot of people think, and I think they're wrong, but they think that Iran is just a fundamentally revolutionary power, that what we need to do is get as many other countries as possible to sort of help us, you know, take them down. Not, not by invading, because it's not practical, but through various coercive measures as far as it's reasonable to go. Well, at, the and, end and of the just, day, at the end of the day, would you like to see the Iranian regime collapse? I think it would be nice for Iran to become a democracy. Right, sure. okay. I mean, you know, with anyone collapse, right, I mean, you hope that collapse leads to democracy. Well, of course. Right? Obviously, obviously it doesn't always. Um, you know, so I, I do think one should be careful with that. And also, I mean, this is also... So something else that's been a bee in my bonnet is your yes. constant efforts to explain away the ridiculous, crazy statements of the Iranian president. Um, I'm just curious, what is it that motivates you to do that? When, well, I, no, I, I, can, can I finish? Can I finish? Can I finish? Sure. Every time Dick Cheney or John Bolton mm-hmm. or um, you know any of these warmongers, Richard Pearl, anytime these guys open their mouth, it's mm-hmm. warmongering, no matter what they say. But any time uh, the Iranian president says something, in, in what to me is pretty clear terms, mm-hmm. you know, when he calls Israel a cancer that sure. should be wiped off the map, that to me sure. is, it's not as you once tried to allude to it as being akin to the, you know, 19th century uh, division of Poland between 
So Prussia and Germany or something. Okay, so, I just, so I'm, this, not, I'm not so charitable towards them. I'm curious right, why this, are you this this so this charitable was the con- this was the contours of the debate, right? Uh, my, my, this uh, it, it started, I think, with uh, with with Jeff Goldberg. And he was compiling a list of statements, yes. which he said were tantamount to uh, incitement to, to genocide, ca- to calls for genocide. And so then I said that's one way to interpret those statements. And I said another way. It's the honest, inter- like you know. But listen, listen, l- listen. Can, can you stop this? Right? Go ahead. Go ahead. I, I, I conceded that's one way you can interpret them. And then I said another way to interpret them is that he was calling for the elimination of Israel as a political entity. So he's calling for a one state solution, essentially, like what Edward Said wanted. I'm saying those are two ways to construe it. Then Justin Logan pointed out that there had, in fact, been interviews, an interview, where Ahmadinejad was asked, what did he mean? And he said that the second interpretation was correct. Now, does that mean that we should believe Ahmadinejad? I, I see no reason to believe him e- either way. I mean, I mean, I don't, I don't think we should take any of that rhetoric seriously. I mean, he's spewing out a hateful rhetoric, and I'm not exactly sure wh- why he's doing it. Uh, and then, but what happened is, is maybe that we should you add. Then, like, you, isn't that you then went isn't that wrote a really? A, 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 you're not sure why. Why don't we question why? I mean, you question let, why listen, no, 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 does what he says. Let, 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 I, I wanted to say right. I, I mean, you wrote a post about this. I thought wildly misconstruing my comments as saying that, you know, I I was being um, an apologist for Ahmadinejad because you thought maybe I was just indifferent to the prospect of of slaughtering everyone in I didn't say that was you. I said said there were three different options. Some some unnamed people. And and honestly, I mean, I I thought that it's it's some serious bullshit, you know, and and you shouldn't go around saying that. No, I didn't say that. I mean, look, there are three ways uh, ways to interpret that 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 sort of... For one way or another, right, the idea of dissolving Israel into some kind of unitary... I mean, that's a terrible idea. So it's its not like okay. one way or the other, Ahmadinejad might be putting a reasonable proposition on the table. But I, I just don't think it's correct to say that he's engaging in incitements to genocide. And I think it's important to, um, you know, when you're having a high-stakes debate in the United States about what our policy toward Iran should be, that there's an effort to shut down that debate with inflammatory rhetoric that's designed to, you know, get people emotional and get them not thinking about it rationally. That involves, A, overstating Ahmadinejad's role in the Iranian government, and B, I think, you know, deliberately construing his remarks in the most alarmist possible way. Do you think it's a big deal if Iran gets a nuclear weapon? Sure. Because you said before that it wasn't that big of a deal. I think it's not as big a deal as some people have said it is, mm-hmm. but it's a... It's a, I mean, th- this is part of what's frustrating to me about the Bush administration's approach to Iran, because they're on the knife's edge between, I think, understating the importance of stopping Iran and overstating it, Mm-hmm. You, you know, that they're they're not... I, I'm not sure exactly what they're going to do if their sort of unwillingness to negotiate is going to end up with an Iranian bomb, in which case I would say they're not taking this problem seriously enough and should be more willing to, you know, sort of get down and dirty here. Or they might start a war of varying levels of intensity, in which case they might be going too far. So but you, it's, you, you it's, think it's, that it's, the burden... it's incredibly preferable for Iran to not have a nuclear weapon. And, and not only that, because I'll go beyond that, right? It's extremely preferable for there to be verifiable disarmament in Iran. Sure. Right? And, and in particular, one of the problems with sort of airstrikes on Iran, with the stuff that John Bolton's been talking about uh, doing, is that there's no way for an airstrike to produce verifiable disarmament. Because you, you, you don't know if you've, if you've, if you've, if you've uh, hit everything. Absolutely. Exactly. Uh, well, you don't know what you've hit. Absolutely. And, and you don't know... I, I mean, the most deadly technology is in people's heads. Yeah, I mean, I just wish... Yeah, I agree with you. I agree with you. And I think a lot of people in the Bush administration agree with you. I just wish you were a little more... Um, Charitable, I don't know if that's the right word, but you know, just more understanding that they're not all a bunch of crazy warmongers, and that they. Well, really I, I don't think they all. I mean, look, I think you saw recently. I'll be interested to know what what you think of the the North Korea. I'm unsure so, about that. I don't. Um, I really don't. But I don't know obviously, to, you know, the willingness to let you know some of those guys go make that deal shows that there are different people who think different ways. Shows that Condoleezza Rice is running. 
the Bush administration foreign policy is what it shows. Well, I don't know. At least the, the North Korea end. I, I mean, I think that... More than that, that, I'd say... I think that that was where the, the Cheney-est side of things had its sort of most obviously disastrous That's true. No, that's and true. They, um, you know, shifted it to, to more pragmatic people. I, I think there's no question that the sort of since starting in 2006 or so, I, I think that's about the right date. The, the Bush administration's front policy has been uh, a lot more pragmatic than, than it was at the beginning. Um, I don't think they've... You know, well, the Bush doctrine, the yeah, and the did. Bush doctrine is is really no more. Um, um, sort of, unless it lives on in in the McCain and John McCain. Yes. Well, let's talk about a region of the world where I think, frankly, the Bush doctrine uh, could be could be useful, uh, which is Zimbabwe, which is the topic of the G eight summit. Right. So, do you today. think we should? Do you think we should invade? Zimbabwe? I'm not saying we should invade Zimbabwe. Okay. Okay. I am saying that I I do believe, however, that. It's become increasingly clear to me over the past couple of months that it's it's really only in a military intervention of some sort, um, preferably a UN intervention um, akin to what was attempted but not carried out successfully in Somalia. Um, I don't know if you saw that story on the front page of the Post on Saturday uh, by Craig Timberg um, about the internal workings of the Mugabe regime. He, he got these interviews and scored scored these great interviews and got internal documents from this meeting that was held a couple of days after Mugabe lost the March 29th mm-hmm. election, which paints a picture that it seems that Mugabe might even be held hostage by his own military and that they're forcing him to not give up. Um, right. I mean, I mean, there's a concern that, right, I mean, Mugabe might strike some kind of deal, in theory at least, that sort of takes him out of the picture but also right. secures his personal interests and then sort of leaves out to dry exactly. all these these kind of goons and war criminals who work. For and it's just more, and what it showed to me, and I think showed to everyone, is that the problem in Zimbabwe, it's not just like a dictator, you know, it's a whole apparatus of power. It's a patronage network. It's a political party. And it's not as easy as just, you know, assassinating one guy. It's right, I mean, there was a... There was a there was an LA Times article yesterday about the sort of um, I guess these camps they've these set rape up for camps. the yeah, for, no, right, for the Zanu PF right and I mean I think it's obvious I mean it's hard to imagine that those guys are just going to sort of disband um, exactly you know, right exactly. you know even even if a whatever agreement was reached um, so I don't I mean I honestly don't know what you what you do about a a thing like that I mean I mean I think the the conventional wisdom. Is probably correct to say that um, you need South Africa to play a, um, shall we say, well, more con- more constructive role. But we've been saying that for the past eight years. No, right. I, I mean, I and I, um, you know, I will say that when when this um, when this business started, I mean, I, I was inclined to give um, to give Becky uh, and his government sort of the benefit of the doubt. Um, I thought you mm. could understand. Why they didn't have, you know, exactly the attitude that their Western powers sure. did. Sure. Um, but it's been appalling, really, yeah. to watch, and even to watch as he's become increasingly isolated among his own, you know, party. other leaders that you've right. seen Nelson Mandela and Desmond Tutu and, and and others start to speak out. And you know, I, I know squat about South African politics. Um, and I, I just don't know what's going on there, but it, it's. It, it would be a difficult issue, you know, one way or the other, but with that kind of backing, it's it's really hard to know, you know, what you can do. I well, mean, I mean, one of the things, is, yeah, I mean, one of the things I find really ironic about this whole process is that, mm-hmm. you know, South Africa's been on the Security Council for the past year. Right. And they have continually thwarted any discussion of this on the Security Council. And in any international forum, they have... Right. And it's, it's just ironic that, you know, people who stood up against apartheid and during the apartheid years, you know, lived in other countries. They lived in England. That's where the ANC was headquartered, was in London, and they had, a, they had a base in Africa as well. And they called right. upon the international community. They said this is a huge international issue. It threatens international peace and security. That's why apartheid South Africa was consistently brought before the UN, because right. only issues that affect international peace and security can be brought before the, before the UN. So it's just so ironic now that you have these same people who 20 years ago were calling upon the world, international sanctions, uh, sports boycotts, everything. They're now saying, right. oh, this is a domestic issue for the Zimbabweans to deal with. Right. And no, and you know, you know it's, as it's I say... It's, 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 it's really just a disgrace, and it's really a stain 
on the record, I, I, I think, of many of these people in the anti-apartheid movement. It would allow this to happen for so long. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I agree. I, as I say, you know, initially it, it seemed to me, you know, these guys and Mugabe were, were allies when they were, you know, out of power, when they were on the run. That's the thing. And, they and they the United States allies. was... I mean, they really, I mean right. Mugabe got money from the Chinese and the ANC got money from the Soviets. So they right, were right. never I mean, really you know, even you know, and close. I, I, just, I, I just mean, I... I you mean, isn't it? They were to, 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 some, to some extent, you know, sure. I, I understood the differing perspectives from from right. in the United States. But I mean, it's gone way beyond that, and to the point where plenty of, of anti-apartheid leaders, you know, seem to have recognized that, including right. I mean, the Zuma, who will presumably take over yes. at some point, um, and and that just makes it, you know, all, all the worse. I mean, I mean, Becky is at only sort of prolonging, you know, disaster for. God right. knows what reason. And, and well, the question know, is, do we wait? Well, I mean, I think the reason has to do with, you know, he's angered the trade union movement in his own country because he's had these conservative okay. free market economic policies. And, and in Zimbabwe, the opposition is led by a trade union leader. And there's this, well, there's okay. this whole, this is the whole post-independent African political problem, right? Which is that you have these parties that came into power through violence and war and won liberation. And they now believe that they have a right to rule in perpetuity. And the ANC, um, obviously, they don't, you know, they don't resort to violence. But right. they view themselves, they view themselves in the same way that ZANU-PF does in Zimbabwe. They view themselves as being the rightful inheritors of the post-apartheid political dispensation. And they believe that, you know, South Africa is essentially a one-party democracy. Um, there's no real, I mean, there's a small opposition, there's a bunch of small opposition parties. I mean, it's not there's a really, meaningful, but, but I mean, but there's meaningful of course, there's opposition meaning, within the party. Absolutely, I mean, it's not, absolutely. But right. I think the one thing that everyone in the ANC would agree with mm-hmm. is that the ANC should be the everlasting should, should rulers right. of South Africa. Right. And right. there's really no um, understanding of, of, you know, parties switching places. I mean, they've ruled right. the country since 94. They have over 70% Right, it is no, no prospect of them losing power. Well, I mean, you could, yeah, I mean, you could have the party break into two. You could right. have the left break off, which would be great for everyone involved. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, back to the question of Zimbabwe, I just, you know, right. I look at a country like that, and it's so easily preventable, in my opinion, because you have countries that border it. You have now Botswana and Zimbabwe and Zambia have spoken out against what's going right. on. And it's just, it's, it should be so easy to solve this problem, right? And right. I just And I just don't... Um, and I just think something should be done about it. I think that there's a price, as much as you guys like to talk about warmongering uh-huh. and bombing countries, I think right. you have to recognize that there's a price of not doing anything. I uh, know, but I mean, I completely agree. And I mean, in Darfur, just... in Darfur, you know, in Darfur, it's very easy to, 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 or in Iraq, every day, it's very easy to point uh-huh. the finger and say, look what's happening, suicide bombing. Yeah, no, 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 no. Wait, people right, but... died. Uh-huh. You know what? I can point at Zimbabwe and say, well, you know what? The world isn't doing anything. And 100 people were just killed in mob violence. Well, you or can, people but are I, starving but, but, to death. Right, but I mean, I don't think we're disagreeing about Zimbabwe. I, I mean, th- this is the point, right? I mean, in Zimbabwe, you're seeing huge costs of, of inaction, and yet you're also seeing a situation where, you know, I don't think anybody thinks that a, a unilateral American invasion. No. Um, it, it, right, no, 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 I mean, exactly. And, and that, you know, you see that, I think, uh, conversely, that there's a, a tendency of hawks to look at. Bona fide humanitarian emergencies, frequently in, in Africa, and sort of pointed them and pointed the difficulty of resolving those situations, and then sort of gesture at Iraq. But the cases just—they don't have a great deal to do with one another, uh, you know. Because what we what we all agree is that the crux of the problem in in Zimbabwe is that it needs to be addressed with the regional powers on board, and the South Africans are are being terrible about this, but at the same time, I mean, we can't we can't have regime change in Johannesburg. No, but what, what, what would you think about, say, boycotting the um, World Cup in, in South Africa in 2010? Or at least talking well, I don't, about I don't think an American World Cup boycott will, you know, really terrify No, no, what about just talking about an international boycott of the World Cup in South Africa? Just raising, the, pros- raising the prospect of it as, as a consequence. I, I guess I, I wouldn't be uh, terribly upset to see somebody raise that. Mm. Um, I mean, I, I doubt that would work um, fundamentally. But, you know, I mean, I think I think it's okay. I, I Take a Combro example. I mean, I, I think it's probably a good thing that the, the Chinese have gotten so much sort of Olympics-related static. I mean, it's it's important, I, I 
do think for Chinese people, for, you know, particularly people in the, the Chinese regime who may be sort of just going along, not, not thinking too seriously mm. about what they're doing, to, you know, hear that China is never going to be accepted as a country, you know, on a par with, you know, Belgium or, or whatever, as long as it, it's a kind of autocracy like that. And in particular, you know, when you see civil society doing that around these kind of sporting events, you know, I think I think that sends a message while also saying that in a sort of pragmatic state to state way, you know, you can you can have a relationship. Right. But, you know, I mean, I mean, countries should know that they take a hit in world opinion when they behave badly and that, you know, it matters and that if they want to be beloved by the world, they have to, you know, do things that are worthy of... of but do the Chinese really care about being beloved by the world, do you think? I mean, I do really think... Well, I mean, I assume, I, ass- I assume some Chinese people care. But does it, does, does it manifest itself in, in changed policies? I don't really see it. I'm I mean, not sure that you do. I mean, what you certainly hear is that Chinese officials were taken aback by the reaction. What does that mean? Kind of are they stopping? Are they are they going to end their support for Khartoum? No, 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 no. I'm, I'm, I'm just saying. I'm just saying that they were they were surprised. You know, people were there. You know, in a place like China, right? I mean, change is going to come. I think not from the top leadership suddenly deciding one day that they want to be nice people, and it's probably also not going to come with some kind of you know, violent revolution, right? Let's I mean, hope, right? You're, you're, yeah. Right. I mean, you're going to have, optimistically, people in the middle ranks, you know, of the government, of the bureaucracy, so on and so forth, deciding that, you know, they personally would, would rather live in a in a democratic society than in an authoritarian one. Um, I, I don't know. I don't think anybody knows exactly how that can come about. Um, but, you know, you hope that these kind of public expressions of disapproval have some impact. But, like, you know, I, I don't think anybody has, like, genius China solutions. I mean, do you? No, that's true. And I, right. uh, I haven't seen anyone advocate uh, a land war in Asia. Well, I mean, you can't do I mean, they're, they're too big. I mean, there's no... It's, it's very, it's very it's hard tempting. to pressure China... It's tempting China. for us warmongers to do this. Sure, to say, it's let's go It's just not in. possible, um, yeah. I, I, I do think there was actually a, a Robert Kaplan article on how we would fight China that was going on at a great length about um, sea battles. When was this published? It was uh, maybe in 2005. And then, and then it has something like, um, well, the question is, how do you end a war like that? You know, it, it might have to go in for full scale regime change, right? And then it just sort of tailed off because I, I, I don't think we have the manpower for like that's probably true. of China, right? That's probably true. So, um, well, can we, we, we can agree on that. We can uh, agree on that that we shouldn't fight a war with China. Okay, that much that much we can agree on. Uh, um, I thought we'd end this with a little kind of. Somewhat humorous discussion. I, I wrote sure. a column uh, last week for the Washington Blade, which is a gay newspaper, about my frustration with why so many gay men, in particular, gay support. men's love of Hillary. Hillary Clinton. Clinton, and maybe this is just my anecdotal experience. Maybe you. Can well, this is a. Agree. This is a. Well, I just think they, I'm going to just give the brief praise sure. of what I said. Let's hear it. Which is that they sort of see her as a diva, right. um, like Cher or right. Kali Minogue, or uh-huh. you know, just name your. Your gay diva, You're right? Your diva, and that she's you know she's struggled and you know she's mm-hmm. dealt with like like Tina Turner dealt with Ike, like she dealt with Bill, and she's the underdog, and we know mm-hmm. what it's like to be the underdog mm-hmm. and to be abused and made fun of and you know on the playground, and she's our woman, and I right. really have a lot of like gay friends who are not going to support Barack Obama, they're either not going to vote or they'll vote uh-huh. for McCain, and that's like another constituency that I think Obama needs to be worried about now is not just white women, but maybe even gay men. Mm. Well, okay. Here, here, Here's what I'll say. You know, I, I think that people sort of, they decide for whatever reason. You know, I like candidate A, I like candidate B. And then they tend to sort of see the candidate, they, they fit the candidate then into cultural archetypes that they like, right? So that to people who are inclined to vote for John McCain, he's this, like, awesome war hero. Right. right? Whereas right. to those of us who are inclined to, to vote against him, he's this, like, grumpy old man. Right. right? Because because both of those sort or, of... Or, as the... What seems to me to be a recurring theme now in the Obama uh, campaign, he, he's, a, he's a psychotic warmonger who we can't trust because of strange things that happened to him in Vietnam. 
I, that yeah. that's bullshit. But but we're, we're going to talk. We're going to talk about Hillary Clinton. Okay. You know, okay. and so I, I mean, I, I do think it's true that to a, a certain number of, of gay men, maybe who who like Hillary Clinton, they've sort of assimilated her to this this diva archetype. Right. But but you know, realistically, I mean, I know I know you voice this concern, and and uh, uh, so is uh, Andrew Sullivan, who who I work with. And, right. Um, but but I think that you know Bill Clinton, for all his sort of shortcomings in terms of gay equality was the, the first and really only president to embrace that cause on any level. How? And so... How? how? Yeah. I think through... I mean, he improved the gays in the military situation. He... Did he? I mean, anti-gay discharges from the military shot up after that policy was adopted. Well, you know, I, I don't know. I, I'm not a defender of that policy. At any rate, I think, you know, that's how he's seen, right? He okay, has, try this. I'm, well, I don't know. I mean, I, I think... I think he's more a reflection of the culture than, than he actively, you know, no, proactively no, no, look, sought to improve these issues. You know, I yeah, think it was the 90s where the 90s were a revolutionary decade for gay rights, and he, if anything, stood opposed to it. He signed the Defense of Marriage Act, which is a Wait, lousy look, law. look, 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 look. I, I, I think that's all, that's all fair criticism, Bill Clinton. I'm, I'm just trying to say, if we want to explain, right, what is the sort of enthusiasm, for, right? For and, Hillary, and we know, well, but right, but I mean, but it, but it transfers, and and obviously, like the, the the human rights campaign as an institution was set up with, I think, close ties to the to the Clinton camp. And, uh, you know, yeah. all, all that all that kind of stuff is evidence, and, and it's true. I mean, it's wrong. I mean, Barack Obama had a somewhat more progressive position. On, he did. On sort of gay. He does. Issues. He does. Yeah. And right, and you know, I think deserved that support. Well, also, I'll ask you this: Do you think you know we saw Obama last week came out right. against the amendment in California, right? Which I thought was a really important move, and it's been right. uh, and I'll I'll give him credit for it, and it's been underestimated in how significant it is, especially when you take into account Carrie and Edwards, those profiles right, of courage. Right, they, they, they did quite the reverse. Every uh, single state they went right. to, they, they campaigned and told right. people to vote for these amendments. Right. Um, so I think it's a sea change, really, that Obama's come out against it. And I don't think Clinton would have. If Clinton were the nominee, I don't think she would take a position on No, I, I'm not sure that she would have. I mean, certainly, I mean, we know that, that Bill's advice to John Kerry was to, to support the come out more strongly against gay marriage. Right, yeah, that it's, it's to support the Federal Marriage Amendment. Right, 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 exactly. So, I, and it, you know, I mean, I do think that that's very much the Clinton you know, but so this, to but Matt, this is, leads me asking, like, where does the love for the Clintons come from? From the gay well, community? look, I, 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 I don't, I, I neither love the Clintons, and I'm not gay, so I, I can't totally speak to this. But, but can you uh, explain it to me? I just no, I mean, I mean, I mean, but I, I, right, but I mean, I've tried to say it. I mean, I, I just think you know that Bill Clinton was seen as sort of the the first president to extend any kind of friendly gestures to to gay and lesbian rights movement. That's true. Um, you know, and so there's a certain, you know, loyalty there. Um, and, you know, I mean, I do think it's misplaced. I mean, I mean, yeah. you know, Obama, um, you know, I, I just, I think, has said and uh, has a, a background in constitutional law and, and so on and so forth that, um, you know, has led him to some sounder positions on this. Obviously, he, like everyone else, is, uh, you know, too terrified or whatever yeah. to actually say he would favor, um, you know, e- equal marriage rights. But if he's going to oppose efforts to take them away once they've been granted, it's, it's a little hard to see the, the difference. Um, yeah, I think you're right. I think deep in his heart, I think he honestly supports gay marriage, but he just it's not a position you can take. Right, but I mean, but I mean, beyond that, I mean, a lot of people you say, well, deep in their heart, they say think X, but on the surface, they say Y. I mean, his support is like pretty close to the surface, right? I mean, if you're going to say that state court ruling is right. in favor of gay marriage should be upheld, stand, right? I mean, that's like you're you're walking right up to the line. Essentially, um, it's the same thing, yeah. right? I mean, because I mean, I assume that the and I think this is a fair point for, you know, real conservatives to raise, is that I assume Barack Obama will appoint judges who are going to look sympathetically on gay equality claims. Well, I will just point out that six of the seven justices on the California Supreme Court were appointed by Republicans. Oh, sure. And three of the four who ruled, and that, well, the, the judge, Judge George, who wrote the majority opinion was appointed by Pete Wilson. I, I right, right, right. No, no, no. Um, I mean, look, obviously uh, the current Supreme Court, I mean... Almost most of the judges were appointed by Republicans. And the governor, of and course, the governor Schwarzenegger, who's a... Is, is a Republican. Right. No, I just, you know, McCain has said no. he wants to appoint judges in a Scalia yes. whatever mode. Yes. Um, you know, he may be... It's actually not unheard of for Republicans to just 
lie about how socially conservative they are. Yes. Uh, R- Ronald Reagan appointed several moderate justices, but, you know, McCain says he will appoint cultural conservatives. Well, do you believe McCain is a social conservative? I really don't believe he is. I, you know, I think he... I think he is in the way that older people tend to be, rather than in the way that deeply religious people tend to be, if you know what I mean. Yeah, but I mean, isn't it kind of impressive that he went on, like, Ellen DeGeneres' talk show? Like, could you imagine, you know, Mitt Romney doing that? Yeah, I, no, I, I, that. I, mean, I mean, I definitely think there's something to that. At the same time, I mean, you know, what kind of political risks is he going to try to run for these causes? You know, right. nothing. I, I think in practice, you know, he'll be with the right wing when they come calling. Um, I mean, I think it's clear if you look at his record that he does not share, you know, some conservatives' passion for these topics. Yeah, I mean, I... Um, I and may even, at least at times, you know, secretly despises them. Or, absolutely. I mean, not so secretly when he denounced Jerry Baldwin. Absolutely, I think he He just he went around and backtracked yeah, it. Yeah, no. You know, yeah. so that is what it is. Well... Um, so, okay, so uh, no invasion of China. No China invasion of China. It's Jerry Falwell. And we agree about John McCain Sorry. on yes. some things. On that aspect. All right. All right. Well, this was good. You know, I said before this, if, you know, if Obama can meet with Ahmadinejad, then why can't Matt Iglesias ah, yes. and Jamie Kirchner right. go blogging heads together? Fair enough. Fair enough. And I'll shut down my nuclear program. Right. You know, and say, uh, no send, my, send my no, best. No to, need to worry. Send my best to the flop house. Ah, will do. Okay. Thanks.